Well, today as we continue in our study of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, three letters written by first followers, disciples of Jesus, John, who was there with Jesus, what we've been focusing on is all the places where he's trying to show us how God wants us to know what is true, and I uh, differentiate that from the things that are false. And so each week we've been looking at different contrasts, comparisons. Today, we've already touched on the first part, but we're going to be looking at the spirit, the spiritual world, our spiritual lives, in contrast to our flesh, which is the physical world. And as we're about to see in a moment, the spiritual world in our lives, and especially in our culture, is kind of hidden in plain sight. Meaning a lot of times people try to downplay that or don't often think about how we are made, not just physically but spiritually. And yet at the same time, even though people try to downplay that, there's examples of it all around us. In fact, just turn on your TV or look at what movies are there presented. And all throughout uh, culture and, and throughout the years, we've had movies like Poltergeist and, and, uh, and the, the Exorcist or even uh, I think there's an upcoming uh, Ghostbusters, which again is the idea that we can't help but think about spiritual supernatural things. It gets our attention. As I was thinking about that, even growing up, I remembered uh, a, a story or a situation in my high school where a bunch of high schoolers were, were interested in a certain uh, graveyard cemetery nearby in, in my hometown where they would have a, a certain uh, gravestone, an angel that if you went at a certain time of night, apparently the angel would appear to be crying or, or the face would, would change. And, and so uh, I was trying to look that up or, or reach out to see, did I remember that correctly? And wouldn't you know it, apparently this is true of many hometowns all throughout the country. There's a certain one that they have a very similar story. So again, it must be one that's just passed around. But as we're about to see and take a, a look at together, God wants us to be Sure, we understand about the spiritual world, the spiritual truth that is all around us and not be ignorant or ignore that. So let's look at um, 1 John chapter 4. We'll look at the first three verses to begin with. It says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is even now is already in the world. So right away, again, very simply put, not everything spiritual is meant to be believed. And the reality is even though uh, a lot of people may not even uh, take time to think about our spiritual lives and the spiritual world around us. The idea is, if we were to put it to the test, there's not much room for error. Because it, when it comes to God's Word, the Bible, when it comes to uh, Jesus Christ, uh, those two things, if they are our starting point, as we're meant to see here, then in contrast, anyone who doesn't have those two things as their starting point is going to perhaps misunderstand Christians and Christianity. Or even more than that, as we talked about last week, they may even become hostile or angry or have opposition. For what? For, for Christians just trying to live faithfully to God and tell others about the love of Jesus. The idea that we're meant to see here is that there are um, some, some things and, and, and ideas presented for us to understand when it comes to the spiritual world around us and God speaks right into it as simply as we've been saying to identify what's true and what is false. And when we think about our culture, especially here in our, uh, in our country and even where we are uh, globally at this time, what's interesting is that when it comes to the spiritual world, there are two contrasting beliefs out there that don't often get resolved uh, that, that, again, are trying to test out exactly what we see here. The first one it's called naturalism. That's what it used to be known as, and that's part of the issue is that there have been many different names in terms of what it means to identify the world that some believe that there is no such thing as spiritual and supernatural. Uh, humanism is another one, naturalism or realism. The idea is people that are only focused on the here and now, things that you can observe and things that you can focus on to see what is true. There is no such thing as spir a spiritual world or spirits within us. And what makes that so difficult is that 
that doesn't actually work. Now, there are some things, as we all would probably agree, that we would want to make sure that we observe and study and learn about this world that God has created. Perhaps, for example, when we are trying to go into outer space, you want to make sure you are doing all your facts and figures correctly. But the idea is that even though that those things are important, they are limited. And here's what I mean by that. Last year, I got to meet somebody who was a researcher at UCLA. And his job was to research GMOs, genetically modified organisms. It's a, it's a new and upcoming field. You might see that on your food labels. And, and part of this, this guy's job was to research, for example, what are the things that cause corn to attract bugs? Or, or why do we need herbicides and pesticides? And so on a molecular level, looking at the DNA, his job is to research and to see what causes those sort of things so that you can create corn in a way that even using the, the new up-and-coming idea, I was fascinated to know he's on the cutting-edge research looking at uh, this thing called CRISPR. And I'll try to do it really brief because it goes well and beyond my understanding, but, but CRISPR is a, a DNA sequence that they have extracted from uh, biology, from, from, from uh, organisms and in, in, in biomes, where you can pull it naturally and use it to identify different DNA strands within things to then pull out and modify it, GMOs. And so as I was talking with this gentleman, I happened to tell him that I am a Christian and, and, uh, and, a, and a pastor. And so I was uh, asking him just curi out of curiosity, I said, what would you want someone like me or, or, or Christians to know about these sort of things? Because we may have some questions or concerns. And I was blown away that he identified that. He said, in fact, he said, I hope that people like myself and other Christians would be very skeptical about what science can do. And here's what he meant. He said, when, in terms of his research, his job is just to look at the DNA, to look at it, to study it, see what it is capable of. But nothing in his research and have academic integrity should ever tell us and cannot ever tell us how we can use those things. So his warning and his challenge is to make sure that we have a value system that lets us know that we're not going to genetically modify things in order to sell food, for example, just to make a profit, only to come find out that there are harmful effects on humans, on our health. The idea is studying the world around us can't provide us those values at all. We need to find those values from outside ourselves. That's a little bit of what we see even presented here to be able to test and know and have a standard where we can go to to find those ideas and how we can live in a way that makes sure that we're not harming one another. So one, one uh, uh, way to go in terms of spirituality that we see presented is there's no such thing as spirituality, and clearly it doesn't work. So now we can go the opposite way, that sadly and, and interestingly enough, there's one that might be presented in our world and culture that says, well, I guess if you're going to be spiritual, it really doesn't matter which, which faith or which religion, because really at the end of the day, all religion, all faiths are doing the same thing. There may be small differences, but some people actually say that all religion, all faiths are really trying to do the same thing. And what we see here and presented in God's word is that's not the case. Not all faiths, not all religions, not all spirituality is the same. In fact, we're meant to see, and strangely enough, those two things that we just identified don't actually fit together, do they? How do we have people who don't believe in a spiritual world also willing to say, well, I guess if you're going to be spiritual, you should be uh, okay with all religions. But the reality is those two things don't often get resolved. But what we see here is a warning to make sure that we don't start with the belief first. We test and we challenge. So our first point this morning, when it comes to the spiritual world, spirit versus flesh, not everything spiritual, spiritual is truly from God. The real test is to confess Jesus in the flesh. And one way we're meant to see this is through the Bible. The Bible itself, God's very word, has been revealed to us, has been made known to us, so that we can have a place to go to see these values played out in our lives. And the reality is one way to look at the Bible, too, is that it is one message, yes, but it is 66 different writings, different books over different times in history, consistently to show the same message, our need for God and then the coming of Jesus, who is another way that we can see and understand how to live this out and how to test out anything else presented spiritually. The intro to the book of Hebrews, one of these writings, identifies this in, in Hebrews chapter 1. It says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers 
through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. So I really like that taking even this short couple of verses, the Bible and Jesus become, well, depending on how you want to look at it, two yardsticks or one. I like the idea of that they're the same yardstick, but on flip different sides with different ways to measure. But that's what we're see, meant to see here, the idea that the Bible consistently points to the coming of Jesus, our need for Jesus. And then at the same time, just so that we don't ever miss out who Jesus truly is, the idea that 1 John chapter 4 is identifying, it's not just enough to know about Jesus, it's to know the real Jesus. Is your Jesus the real Jesus? I, in fact, had somebody ask me that precise question when I was finishing up high school, going into college, and I could tell a lot of things about Jesus growing up, going to church, but it was a great question to consider to make sure that we know it is important to know who Jesus truly is in our lives. And the idea, as we see presented here, is that Jesus truly came in the flesh. He is fully God, the Son of God. We know that because he says that Jesus came before he was born, meaning he existed with God eternally, the Son of God from God. And yet there was a time where he didn't lose anything, but he gained humanity, fully taking on being born into our world so that now he has permanently changed forever. He is fully God and fully one of us, a human, except for he did not sin in any way as we see here. The idea is that we're, we're meant not just to see Jesus as, as, as just, just fully God. That's not enough. We're not just meant to see, and it's true, that Jesus is fully man. But again, if he was either one of those things, that wouldn't truly be a sacrifice. The idea that when it comes to our sin and trusting and, and realizing what Jesus has done, it required the Son of God, fully God, who, who came to become one of us, a sacrifice, not in what he, he left, not that he lost anything, but the idea that he came and surrendered himself to becoming fully man. And the idea, too, is, is that it's not truly a sacrifice if we just think about him as the Son of God, but the idea is that, sadly, some, even in the early church, as we see here, early Christians were wrestling with this, saying, how could God fully become man? So they, they came up with that, that wrong belief that is addressed continually here in 1 John, the idea that Jesus didn't just come in appearance of a man. Why? By taking on flesh, being born. The idea is that he could uh, uh, suffer through all the agony and pain and suffering on the cross for us due to our sin. Fully God fully man. So now we have another way to identify whenever we see wrong things presented, wrong things that are brought up, the idea that we don't add to or take away from anything that God has said or that God has done. And sadly, as we see that sometimes in the midst of situations or not wanting to overstep or even sometimes uh, trying to grasp at any idea that we have on our own, we might be willing and, and tempted to go with the flow instead of standing firm on God's word in the Bible. And that's what we see also in Matthew 26. We get a, a simple example of one of the first disciples, or the early followers who did this, Peter. In Matthew 26, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. The idea here is that giving Peter the benefit of the doubt, I don't think he, he seemed to realize what was going on. He was just looking at what Jesus was describing and saying he was going to do. And he was thinking things naturally, what comes to him to say, Wait a minute, Jesus, that doesn't sound good. Not realizing, not, re not intentionally necessarily trying to go against Jesus. It wasn't that he was trying to say, I'm going to prove Jesus wrong and I'm going to prove Satan right in this situation. But aren't we glad that Jesus here examples exactly what the Bible does for us? That Jesus helps him out. Jesus corrects him and Jesus points him to who he is and what he's going to do for us. Just like in our own life, whenever we come up with uh, and come across any other spiritual idea or spiritual thing that comes up, the first thing that we should be uh, willing to do is to rely on God, rely on his word, and look to the Bible to find where we get our information. 
A few uh, examples that, that kind of came to my mind as we look at, again, some of the, the things that are presented in, in the world around us. One of them we've already identified. How do we reconcile that idea that some people say, well, all religions, all faiths, everyone's just going to go to heaven. Why would a good God send anyone to hell? Well, the idea is that, that as the Bible points out in Acts 4, there's no other name by which we are saved besides Jesus. And maybe a simple way to think about that is consider Jesus dying on the cross. And in that moment, someone looking at Jesus and saying, you know, Jesus, that's great, but I, I don't know if I need that. I'd rather just go with another religion because that religion is going to get me to heaven. In fact, Jesus would probably say in that situation, if that's true, if there was any other way, then I want that way. But it required Jesus to suffer and die for us, to show us that he is the only way to be saved. So we can rely on that and, and lean into that to know that God has provided for us. His grace, not by our own effort, that we rely on the finished work of Jesus on that cross. The second one that, that often uh, might, might even come up in terms of uh, understanding, we talked about a few weeks ago when we looked at the law, the commands of God. Sometimes people look at the Bible and say, well, the Bible is just too old-fashioned. The Bible is just maybe trying to make us feel guilty, trying to make us look bad and tell us how we are sinners, when, really, when the reality is it's the other way around. We all experience guilt, don't we? Every one of us, due to sin. The reality is that Jesus came to deal with that guilt. He came and said in John 10.10 10, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to do what? Give us life. Give us life abundantly. The reality is, and I even heard it recently from a, from a sermon I was listening to where someone said that, you know, the reality about sin is that it's fun. And I heard that and, I, and that challenged me. And he went on to say, well, the reality is that if sin isn't fun, then you're doing it wrong. And it really got my attention to think about it. And the reality is, I don't want that to be true. But there is a sort of truth in that, isn't there? The idea that temporarily, the idea of wanting and getting what we want on our terms apart from God, that might promise us fun. That might promise us a temporary feeling that we want. But the reality is, and thankfully as we see in the Bible too, any temporary promise that sin provides doesn't last it ultimately comes, as we see here, to steal, kill, and destroy. The reality is none of us are perfect. We don't live out God's ways perfectly, but it allows us to take into consideration, I don't know, just one of, of the Ten Commandments, again, to use an, as an example of how this isn't to, meant to hurt us, to make us feel guilty. But the Seventh Commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And the idea is on that one, that is one that if we don't take seriously, can ruin our marriages can destroy families. So if anybody ever wanted to say, how do you know that is true? Well, the reality is, is that God wants us to have families and, and lives that are meant on giving life to one another, which is why we take it seriously to not come anywhere close to making compromises with those from the opposite sex. Why? Because we should all agree, no matter who, who you are, should all agree that we want marriages and relationships that are healthy, but we just happen to see that God provides that for us here. One more simple one that we see even potentially as we continue forward and for newer and younger generations up and coming to say, well, the idea is, well, I, you know, someone might say, I'm a Christian or I believe about God spiritually, but why would I have to belong to a church? Well, the idea is that from the Bible, we see that message presented in Ephesians 5. As one example, it, sees that it says that husbands to love your wives as what? As Jesus loves the church. The idea is that when we have an understanding of that way, wouldn't it be great to love the church the way that Jesus loves the church? Not just when we gather together like we're doing so here or even online, but our value to being God's people, living that out as we're called to be here at Michigan Center Bible Church. In fact, as I was thinking about that, and, and, and sometimes we do hear these things to say where people said, well, I don't go to church because I've been heard or, or people have done some of the things that we've even seen presented here have strayed away from God's word. Well, I think and I would hope that our answer would be to say, well, why don't you come to our church? Why don't you come to Michigan Center Bible Church? Because we know we are standing upon God's word. And we understand that we are not perfect. But that's precisely why we need Jesus. Wouldn't, we, wouldn't it be great to continue praying, God, help us to love your church the way that Jesus loves the church. Another way the Bible even defines that and describes it is that the church is the body. We are the body of Christ. But Jesus is the head. And if we don't have him as the head, that's when we get misaligned. That's when we miss out on what we're seeing presented here. 
The Bible says to test out anything spiritual that we see presented. But up next, we're going to get another way that we can see and live this out in terms of trusting God when it comes to the spiritual lives that he's given us. Let's pick back up in verse 4. It says, You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. This is about the third or, or maybe even fourth time that we've seen a reference to us being the children of God. Again, so that we never forget the new nature, the new reality of who God has called us to be. The idea of here being born spiritually and the, and the idea of being born physically or about the, about, uh, from the flesh is continually mentioned throughout the Bible to get our attention to make sure we understand what's being presented. In fact, John's gospel, first, uh, the first chapter of John, puts it this way, Yet to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The idea here is that we're meant to see that, that flesh, physically, we are born physically. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But the idea there that, uh, he, that he gave us the, the right, the idea is that we have the authority, the authorization to be born spiritually from God. God is the only one that it can allow that to happen. Not of human decision, not of natural descent. That's also translated in other places to say not of the flesh. The idea is that we need God to do that, to provide that as we place our trust and respond to his grace that only Jesus provides. And then in verse 7, we see him mentioned, and then that carries us to the rest of our section this morning, another way, another benefit of what that looks like, which is the radical love of Jesus. It's Jesus' love that radically changes our hearts, allows us to understand what it means to be God's children, to change our thinking and changes how we live as we revere, nurture, and guard God's love. This is how we can know God's love for us. In fact, that's what's meant to be uh, presented here in our second point. The first one is about a belief, trusting God's word, belief in, in trusting Jesus that he came in the flesh, fully God, fully man. But just so we don't misunderstand it, it's not just about an intellectual knowledge. We're also meant to understand God, to know God spiritually through the love of Jesus. In fact, John Calvin, one of the reformers, 1500s, 1600s, uh, who, who got back to God's word. Aren't we grateful for people who, who, who tried to identify ways that people tried to add to God's word or took away from God's word? But John Calvin says we can never separate the love of God from faith, what we know and trust about God. It'd be like removing, trying to remove heat from the sun. It cannot happen. So our second point this morning, the world needs to know spiritual truth from God. But we need to watch out for spiritual lies. God's love helps us discern and decide how to live. In fact, moving forward as we continue in this passage, in verse 8, it's going to tell us about the strong love of God in a way to get our attention to say that if we don't know God, if someone doesn't know God, then they don't have his love. And if they don't have his love, then they are missing out on the limitless power, the, the amazing greatness only found in, in Jesus and the idea is that once we know God and once we start experiencing his love, something amazing happens. We go from maybe just knowing about God, what we heard about God, but we start to take our focus off not just the giver, but we start to focus and look at, the, the sorry, not looking at the gifts that God gives, but looking at the giver. Focusing not just about knowing about God, but focusing on truly knowing and experiencing the love of God. Our own love cannot do this. Uh, uh, previously, we've already identified that generally speaking, people can have a general love for God uh, because the idea is that even though sin has entered the world, it has affected our ability to love, but it hasn't totally destroyed it. And yet what we're meant to see here is that only through Jesus do we understand and overcome the hurts that we experience, the pains that we go through, the attacks, the hardness of heart. But now with a new nature, 
It might not feel it much at first. There may be times where we struggle through, but the reality is we can't help but love. We are his children. That's what we see made evident as we recognize that allows us to have fellowship with God our Father and fellowship with one another. The idea here in 1 John 4 is that this is precisely what Jesus came to do. He is the one that gave it to us. And yet, whenever we find ourselves struggling with the hurts that people uh, attack us with, or or as we see that people are are not only just attacking ideas or attacking beliefs, but attacking the very character of one another, in the midst of some of the difficulties, the reality is when we we lose sight on who God is, it's a great reminder that there is so much more to God's love than we can truly imagine. The Bible says this continually, but one great place to look is Ephesians 3 that describes God's love this way. It's a prayer, isn't it? It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. The idea is that God's love is infinite, infinite, beyond comprehension. There's always more to be understood. And again, as we see here in the prayer, is that it's a reminder that we don't earn this on our own. That's what grace is all about. We are dependent on God to reveal that, to show that to us. Sometimes we struggle through this because God's love is so different than any other love that we experience. We're used to a love in this world that is love uh, based on attraction or, or love that's, that's just based on, uh, on if you don't offend somebody, the moment offenses happen, then love can be withheld. But what we see here with God's love is that it lasts for, forever. Love is his very character. His very attributes are given and lived out to us by his very nature can't be understood apart from Jesus. In fact, to help us in this this passage, I enjoyed a a couple simple illustrations from uh, a pastor named John MacArthur who who uses some very practical ways to help us grab our attention and and to think about the surpassing love and greatness uh, of God. The first is from uh, the jazz trumpeter uh, Louis Armstrong. He also sang, uh, What a beautiful, wonderful world. I won't sing it for us here. But the idea is that one day, would you believe it, somebody came to Louis Armstrong, the jazz trumpeter, and said, Louis, you seem to know a thing or two about jazz. Can you explain jazz to me? And Louis Armstrong looked at him and says, man, if I got to explain it to you, you ain't got it. That's a little bit of what we're meant to see here with, with God's love. We can talk about it, we can look at it, we can see a passage like this, but that God's love is meant to be experienced as we hear his word, as it takes a hold of our heart and we realize our need for his love and respond in faith, repentance, and trust in Jesus. We are meant to not just live it out sometimes, but we're meant to live this out continually, which is the other illustration from a guy named Julian Ellis Morris. He was a British man who was, who was very rich back one day in history. Rich house, a lot of possessions, but wouldn't you know it? This, this fella, for whatever strange reason, he loved every day for his entire life, even though he had immense wealth, he would, he would wake up early and he would dress in, in beggar's clothes. He would wear rags and he would go door to door and he would knock and he would try to sell these little trinkets just to get a little bit of money, only to go back at night to his giant mansion alone by himself, dying at age 75 with an immense storehouse of, of riches that were his, that he didn't seem to enjoy the riches that he had. That's precisely what we're seeing here. The idea at the beginning of this prayer, out of his glorious riches, it doesn't say, I pray that you would get a little bit more of the riches. No, the idea is that through Jesus, we are blessed beyond measure. We are given his incredible love for us. And the idea is that's not meant to be just enjoyed sometimes, only to go back to our rags. That's the old way of living. When we go back to trying to earn and trying to prove or trying to gain instead of recognizing that God has gifted us his son, the love of Jesus that transforms our thinking, transforms our lives. And so practically speaking, whenever we are hurt, that's why we choose to forgive. Why? Because when we don't choose to forgive, that robs other people of the joy that they could be experiencing as well. But we long for others to enjoy and appreciate and understand this amazing love that you've got to uh, experience to understand. 
We're called to test each thing spiritually, to know the true nature of Jesus and here not to neglect the love of God. Finally, as we finish up, verses 8 through 12 are going to give us one final way, looking forward and looking upward, to consider our spiritual lives versus our flesh. 1 John 4, 8 through 12 says, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God uh, showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. God is love. You can't get any more simple than that. And yet that is still so profound. It is his love, his attributes given to us to uh, transform us and not to be confused the other way around. We worship God who is love, but love is not God. We don't worship love because why? True love, the love of God, can't be experienced apart from him. Already in 1 John, we've seen here that God is, is defined as love. We've already seen that God is defined as light, meaning he's perfect in all his ways, holy. And then finally, as we finish this up, saying that no one has seen God, we also see moving forward a description to know that, G, that God is spirit, meaning that, that he's holy. He, he, he can't be experienced and known and seen. No one has seen him. In fact, we saw that presented there, and there's two other places in the Bible that also say the same thing. No one has ever seen God. So how is it that we can, we can know him? Moses in, in, in Exodus 33 caught on to this and said, I want to see you, God. I want to see your full glory. And even Moses, he got pretty close. God granted him just a glimpse. But the idea is that speaking to Moses and the idea of moving forward is that God had a greater plan. God had a greater way that we can know and understand who God is. It was by sending Jesus who took on flesh. In fact, Philip, one of the disciples, even asked Jesus that, saying, Jesus, you've been talking a lot about God and the kingdom. Can you just show us the Father? Aren't we glad that Jesus says that's exactly what he came to do? By being born fully God, fully man, the idea is that so we can know and see and understand God. Now we see in just a glimpse. But the idea is that one day we will see God fully face to face. Our final point this morning as we think through this is that God is spirit, but we can see and know him through Jesus who took on flesh to reveal God so we can know his love. Sometimes, even though Moses got a glimpse of Jesus, sometimes we too might be tempted to settle for thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could just see a small vision or a small glimpse of who he is? But the idea is that through Jesus, we are given abundantly more than what we can imagine. The idea is that through Jesus, we can know and be rest assured that we are fully saved, justified, knowing that on the day of judgment, we don't have to fear. But we can know that the verdict has been given for each of us as we place our faith and trust fully in God. That one day, through the grace and forgiveness of Jesus, we can have an eternity with God forever. In fact, as we look forward to the final two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 talks about how God, one day, as we trust in him, we will know that the new heaven will come down to the new earth that he's prov uh, providing so that one day as we think about the spiritual versus the, the physical, one day there will be no separation. And then in Revelation 22, here's what we see described to give us that hope that we can keep trusting, looking forward to what he has provided for us. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down in the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light or the lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. We get that promised to us that one day, not only the new heaven and the new earth will be unified, as we know that we will breathe our last breath, our, deads will, our bodies will die, be buried in the ground until the Lord returns. But one day, we will be given a new body, 
And we'll be there in the new city, the new Jerusalem, that the old Jerusalem had a temple before the coming of Jesus where people had to go and, and experience the, the presence of God, but even there they weren't able to enter in to see God face to face. They had to have a priest to do so. But now, as we see here in heaven described, in the new city, the new heaven, new, the new earth, there is no need for a temple. Why? Because we have complete access to God to be, see him, his blessing, face to face forever. And for you gardeners out there, we also see a description of a garden, don't we? We see water with a, the tree that, that, that blooms, that, that provides fruit, that shows that physically we will have no more pain and suffering. Spiritually, there will be nothing hindering us. Complete, ageless blessing face to face with God forever. Eternity now invites us to participate in this, to anticipate that one day, Anything that we struggle through here, the struggle to love others through the love that God provides will be gone. We will be spiritually and physically united once again with Christ and will be united for, with any others that have their faith in Jesus forever. As we rely on God now, trusting in Jesus who came in flesh, not just a historical truth, but should also remind us that he provides the love that we need both now and one day, the promise of seeing him forever. Would you bow with me as we pray before in a closing song? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. We are humbled that you would love us, that you would send your son, Jesus, and more than that, provide for us ways to, to live that out, not because we, we have to in order to earn your love. Why? Because you call us your children as we place our faith and, and trust relying on you to do what only you can do, Jesus. Thank you so much for coming and taking on flesh, helping us to, to rely on the amazing, glorious riches. We join in with the prayer that we've already seen here, God. Would you help us to continue to not look at our imperfections, not look at our frustrations or the hurts that others provide, but that we could live out your grace by forgiving one another, knowing that we are truly forgiven in you, Jesus. That's what this world needs, and we're dependent on you. We pray that we would continue as a church to love your church, the love that you have, Jesus. Thank you for this amazing gift of a, a community and a family that we can serve and, and enjoy and belong to. It's a way to be strengthened and encouraged knowing that we are standing firmly upon your word, God. Help us to test out anything that comes our way that might come to distract from us to see Jesus. We pray for more and more of your blessing to be true, both now and as we look forward to forever being with you. We pray this in the perfect name of Jesus. Amen.